guys, we're in a new season. We've just done soul renovations, and we're, in, we're stepping into Christmas. And Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. I don't care what anybody says, because I love Christmas. It's my favorite. Because things like the hamper appeal happen. Things like the production. Things like people coming together and actually celebrating Jesus. The one gift that we all need, Jesus. And um, we're going to read a story out of... Um, Ch- uh, Luke chapter 2 and chapter 1, where um, Jesus actually comes onto the scene. Right before Jesus comes, we're going to read about um, two different people that responded um, to the call that God had for them. And, and what do we do when God speaks to us? What do we do when God speaks? Because we know that He's speaking all the time. And so, how do we respond to Him? How should we be responding to Him? And He's got something good for you. He's got something good for me, and I'm very excited. So the topic that I want to talk about is um, it hits everyone differently. You might be sitting there thinking, I actually do hear God all the time. I actually do um, spend really good quality time with my father, and he speaks to me regularly. So this is just a wholesome reminder for you. There's also people in the room who have actually been so busy this year, and they've actually drifted so far from God, and you're sitting there like, does he even want to speak to me anymore? Am I even worth his time? So what am I going to do when he actually speaks to me? And then some of you in the room are actually like, you're you're serving, you're here every week, you're doing your thing, but there seems to be some kind of disconnect. It's like you're just doing it, but there's no passion. There's no, do you know what I mean? So all of us have this. We all need to hear from God. We all need to respond to him and That's why I want to talk about it now because we're we're headed into a season, Christmas season, where we all have a part to play. We all have family who need Jesus. We all have family who need to hear his message. We all have an invitation to give to church, to have a conversation about our Savior. And so this is for everyone, no matter where you're at, no matter what relationship you have with God, no matter where you sit, it's for everyone. And I'm I'm a little bit nervous. I told Cam on the way here, um, anytime I speak, I get like real queasy because it's like, if, am I going to actually vomit or am I actually going to bring life? Do you know what I mean? So I'm a little bit nervous, but it's going to be good. Um, have you ever felt like asking the question of God, like, where are you? Like you've, you've gone so long and you just haven't heard him clearly and you're just like, where are you, God? Are you actually with me? Are you actually there with me? You know the scriptures. You know that he actually said, like it says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will never abandon you. I'm with you to the end of the age. Like we know all of those scriptures, but sometimes there's just those moments where we're like, where actually is he? Is he actually right there with me in my pain? Is he actually there standing beside me? And I want to go through those promises that God gives us. The first one is Deuteronomy 31. He says, Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid and don't panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will never fail you or abandon you. Let these sink in. Joshua 1.9 says, This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Psalm 91 verse 14 says, The Lord will not reject his people. He will not abandon his special possession. Isaiah 41 says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I'm your God. And Matthew 28 Um, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We're coming into Christmas and there's the promise. The virgin will have a baby and he'll be named Emmanuel, God with us. We know all of these, right? We know what the word says, but sometimes, is he actually speaking to us? He's always speaking to that other person, but is he speaking to me? Has he got something special for me? I want to tell you this morning he does. So how are we going to respond to him when he does? Let's pray. Father God, you're with us. We know that. We know you're with us at all times. You're for us. You're here. And I pray, Lord, that you would reveal your truth to us afresh today. 
And let us not talk about you today like you're not here. We thank you for your love, God. We thank you for your patience and your kindness towards us. And thank you for choosing us over and over and over again. Amen. Amen. I don't know um, where you, how much you understand of the Bible. Did you know that in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's like 400 years gap. There's like 400 years where the Israelites from Malachi to Matthew had to wait to hear from God. I mean, sometimes we have like a couple of days where we haven't heard from him, but 400 years, that's a long time. Like imagine you're praying for healing and you have to wait 400 years for it. That's a long time, right? They call it the 400 years of silence. And I would feel quite lonely in 400 years of absolute silence. And so we can understand the Israelites. We can understand when we read about these two people, they're the first people that God speaks to after 400 years of silence. That's pretty cool. And so when we're talking about how we're going to respond when Jesus talks to us, these guys, so most of the time got it right. And then we're going to talk about how they got it wrong. <laughs> because, um, and we can relate to when they got it wrong. And so I, I kind of think, like, if it's 400 years of silence, they kind of had to play Waymaker over and over and over again. You know the bridge where it's like, even if I don't see it, you work. Even if I don't. And they just keep playing it over. Because you have to. When you're not hearing something, when you're not getting refreshed, if you're not feeling that, you, you have to play worship. You have to actually get that in you. And so for these guys, they're playing it over and over and over again until God breaks the silence. It's actually... Um, spoken about in Galatians 4, he says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. And so we understand that those 400 years were on purpose. Those 400 years of waiting was important. And then he breaks the silence. But first, who are these two people? Who are these two people that we're going to actually like profile and understand? The first one is Zechariah. Zechariah is um, a priest. He's a Jewish priest. He, when we pick up the story, he's actually going about his daily duties, his weekly service in the, in the temple. And he has a wife. His wife's name is Elizabeth. And um, Elizabeth is actually like a PK. So she comes from the line of Aaron. She's actually, she understands the whole church thing. She understands the ritual. She understands everything about that. And they're actually both, as a couple, they're both considered very righteous. They're well known for how they listen and they follow God. And I'm sure you know some people like this. You know people around you that are so connected to God. They seem like they're getting it right. They seem like they've got it all together. And um, the, the only thing that they're struggling with, the only thing that they have a stigma about um, is actually that Elizabeth can't have kids. So they've been waiting, they've been waiting, they've been waiting, and they just can't seem to conceive. And, and so... We're going to read from his perspective, but then we're also going to read from Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And Mary, let's understand her for a minute. She's from Nazareth, which is actually a town that's looked down on. And so she's already on the back foot. She's already looked down upon. She's probably some, like, lives in peasant um, vibe. She's engaged to Joseph. You, you guys already know this, right? This is a Christmas story. Um, but she's very, very young because back then, when you, you hit 12 years old, you're eligible for marriage. Like, that's pretty young. And um, I want to see how she responds when God speaks to her. And so if you've got your Bibles, we're actually going to read the whole thing right now. So it is going to be on the screen behind me, but it'd be awesome if you read along on your Bible, reading from the NLT version. So first, Zechariah, Luke chapter 1. Verse 5, when Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty um, that week. Did you know back then there were like 24 orders, like groups of priests, and they only actually served two weeks out of the entire year? Can you imagine only serving 14 Sundays? That's it. No midweek, no nothing. 
just 14 Sundays. So can we just honour all of the volunteers that are here like all the time? <laughs> You're actually awesome. You've got the mission and we love you. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and over... Okay, I would be too, guys. If an angel just miraculously appeared in front of me after 400 years of silence, I'd be shaken too. <laughs> Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the, go of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, and this is where we're going to hit, how did he respond? Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you'll be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. And I'd actually want to prophesy right now, if you're actually in that waiting period of actually waiting for your child to come, that God is actually going to give you children. In Jesus' mighty name, you will conceive. And I actually think in next year, we're actually going to see in heaps, heaps of babies in this church. So can you just grab onto that? Can you actually put hope back into your, into your marriage and you will actually see God's promises come about? Now, Zechariah, he's going about his daily service. He, he knows what to do. He's considered righteous. He just has one thing that he's been praying for. And I actually want, I wonder what his prayer was. Gabriel said, your prayer has been answered. Was it the prayer for a child or was it actually a prayer for God to move? Was it something bigger than what he was actually just praying for for himself? Was his prayer answered and was he favoured because of that or something bigger? <clears throat> so there's Zechariah. Let's read about Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She, she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favoured woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. It's like they have to say that every time they pop up. Guys, don't be afraid. <laughs> it's okay, I'm here on purpose. For you have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He'll be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, and here we're going to talk about it, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left her. We've got two different responses here. 
you might just face value look at that and just say, oh, Mary did it right. Mary was an immediate, yep, let's do it. She, the only question that she asked was, I just don't know how. Whereas Zechariah, he's actually questioning it. Is it actually going to happen? But because they both asked how, you're actually allowed to ask God how. Your I don't know is okay with God. He's okay with you asking how. The only difference between Mary and Zechariah is that Zechariah's motivation was out of, I don't actually believe you. I don't actually know if that can happen. How will I know? How can that happen? And so for me, I look at these two responses and I think, well, if God speaks to me, my response is to believe it. When God speaks to you, do you actually believe what he's telling you? When you read the word, do you actually trust that his promises will come and they will never fail? Because sometimes when we read it, if we don't see it in the natural, we can lose hope. Zechariah, he's been waiting a long time to have a child. He may have lost hope. And so he's like, well, why, not, why now? Why not years ago? How will I know that this will happen? And he's questioning God's authority. And then Gabriel obviously has to say, I'm Gabriel. I literally come from God. And then whereas Mary, she obviously just said, let it be. Just let it be. I believe you. This is crazy. This is nuts. I'm a bit disturbed. But it's okay. I'll do it. <laughs> the second thing I noticed is that is what they actually declared now, unfortunately for Zechariah, he'd got to declare nothing because he was silenced. But Mary, she was able to declare and agree with what God said. Hers was instant. Hers was all in, let it be unto me. She submitted without doubt that that thing would happen, that what God said was true. Whereas Zechariah didn't, and so he was silenced. And so his declaration was withheld. But I kind of want to look at Zechariah for a minute because let's consider, let's not get too judgmental about him. Um, as I said before, like he's been waiting a long time. Hope deferred can actually make the heart sick. You've all experienced that. We all have prayers for God. And if they don't happen the way that we think they happen, we can actually just get a bit downcast. We can get a bit worried I mean, I don't, I don't know, there's too many examples. But for him, even though he was considered righteous, he was a priest, uh, Elizabeth was from the priestly line, we need to remember that he's human, so are we. And we can actually operate in serving God every day and still be confronted with unbelief. So when we look at Zechariah's response, we can actually empathize with that. We can understand the questioning. We can understand the, how will this happen? How will I know? But what we learn from Mary is that it's immediate and that we actually trust him. So we need to believe God at his word. We declare his word. And the next thing that I want to touch on is what they did after that. Because as I said, God's word will never fail. They both had those children. Both were taking part in God's will. And that's a very exciting place to be. So what they did after that is they gave thanks. They actually said, yes, God, I believe you. I'm going to declare your word and I'm going to thank you for it. No matter what it is. I mean, can you imagine Mary for a minute? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give birth to the, the one that we've been waiting so long for. That's insane. You've just asked me to also go back out into the community and I'm going to be pregnant with, and I'm not married and I'm going to lose everything. God, are you going to protect me? And obviously he did. But they gave thanks. Mary, very soon after finding out about Elizabeth, she actually visited and she actually had a song and her song was all about thanking God. Thank you for the favor. Thank you for the... Um, the gift that it is to partner with you. 
And Zechariah, the first thing he did when he was able to speak, he started prophesying. He started making those declarations about who John the Baptist was. He, he started saying, thank you, God, for all of that. He had nine months to think about it. Nine months to think about his response. And the first thing that came out of his mouth was praise and honor and thanks to God. So believing his word, declaring his word, giving thanks for it. You know, Mary throughout scripture, um, it talks about her storing things up in her heart. What are you storing up in your heart? Are you storing up the things that are going wrong in your world? Are you reflecting more on those? Are you reflecting on how long you've waited for God to speak to you? Or are you actually reflecting on the things that he has done? Reflecting on the good things. And I encourage you to actually just sit for a moment and think about everything that God has done for you. And give thanks for that. I mean, he's brought you out. He's put you in this room. He's put you in a family, a church family, where you can actually be uplifted and encouraged. And the final thing I noticed about these two is that they participated. They didn't just hear God, but they actually did what he said. They actually participated in the mission of God. You know, Mary's response, let it be unto me, and it was. She had to face her fiancé. She had to have the hard conversations. But she had to keep God at the center of all of that. Zechariah, even though it started in doubt, based on his experience, he didn't allow himself to stay there. And I want to tell you that you're actually not big enough for God to not still move his mission. Even if you have those moments like Zechariah where you pull back or you have doubts or you have questions, he's actually still going to bring about his mission. God planned and initiated. Both Mary and Zechariah cooperated. Nothing that you can do, regardless of your response, can change his earnest desire to be with you, to work with you and partner with you and love you. And you might not end up giving birth to the saviour of the world. That might not be your thing to participate in. But participation with God isn't about the task. It isn't about what he's actually asked you to do. It's simply participating. It's simply doing what he wants you to do. Believe, declare, give thanks and participate. When God speaks, this is what we do. Um, I didn't, I wasn't going to, but when we were singing the song Wells, uh, it was just so um, powerful, the thought that there are people in the room who don't feel connected. There's people in the room who you've gotten to the end of the year and you just don't know where it's headed. And when we kept saying, I need God, I need God, I need God, can you imagine where Zechariah was? He may not have had words to it, but he's like, God, I need you. I need you, I need you, 